Ann Giardini is a Canadian business executive, journalist, lawyer, and writer. She's the oldest daughter of the late Canadian novelist Carol Shields and lives in Vancouver with her husband of more than 30 years. She has written two novels, and with her son Nicholas, she edited Startle and Illuminate, a book of her mother's thoughts and advice on writing. Giardini is currently serving as the 11th Chancellor of Simon Fraser University. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Now, I want to talk about uh, your mother, about her advice on how to write, but also about the prize that now has her name on it. And I'd like to go through the book, Startle and Illuminate, starting with the epigram, which uh, she wrote. And the epigram says, I've always believed fiction to be about redemption, about trying to see why people are the way they are. And that strikes me as being a non sequitur. What do you think? <laughs> well, I can't speak for her, sadly. But of course, she was an enormous believer in the power of fiction. What fiction gives us in the ability to see ourselves and others differently, to experiment with different selves, and to expand our consciousness about self and others. So I don't know that life itself offers you many opportunities for redemption, but there's no question that fiction can redeem you. And I'd have to look at the etymology of redemption, but it has in it, I think, some element of bargaining and of an exchange being made, of one yeah. thing being yeah. exchanged for another. There's no question that when you read fiction, you're exchanging uh, an uninformed self for an enlarged self. And what do you have to pay? almost nothing almost nothing you just have to listen to stories if you can't read the libraries fortunately in Canada are free uh, except for those darned uh, late fees which all of us incur from time to time books can be found on little libraries at street corners everywhere and if you're desperate I think and you were to waylay a stranger in the street and beg for a book you might just get one I, I think the price of this redemption is is almost nothing just your time and uh, an interest, I guess. Yes, and maybe sometimes uh, the suspension of disbelief, maybe sometimes a bit of effort, uh, maybe sometimes a desire to push through, even if unpersuaded. So maybe some of that, but that's part of the enlargement that happens. Now, Jane Urquhart, the Canadian novelist, wrote the foreword, and she speaks of Carol's uh, writing voice and how extraordinary the sound of her actual voice was. She called it bell-like and musical. And what she said was that it would sing in the mind long after she had said it. Now, we were just talking about The Great Gatsby. Nick uh, Carraway describes uh, Daisy Buchanan's voice as sounding like money. <laughs> so what does, or what did, <laughs> what did Carol's voice sound like? It sounded like focused attention on just the, the person that she was speaking with. She was one of those people who gave you her full and absolutely undistracted attention, uh, always. And so when you spoke to her, spoke with her, you felt the attention of an intelligent, creative, insightful listener and that's you don't find that all that often I once spoke to a, a lawyer a fellow lawyer at a cocktail party and we found that we were both very interested in the ethical art of listening and how it's a misunderstood art and seldom taught and we we agreed over our third glass of wine to actually write a book about the ethical ethical art of listening but we never got around to it <laughs> so I guess it's on my to-do list but my mother had that in she just had that uh innately she had the uh, she was the because she was generally interested in, in you and what you had to say and that can't be faked and so no wonder people sought her out sought her company wanted to be with her and no wonder she was she was enormously 
appealing. And men and women fell in love with her throughout her life in various ways. I don't think she knew that that wasn't how most people move through the world. (laughs) (laughs) That's a pretty lovely way to move through the world, isn't it? You know, I experienced it once recently. I happened to meet Obama at an event in Vancouver and um, an organization that I was chair of hosted him. And I had a chat with both him uh, and with uh, Michelle Obama and both of them had that same knack of absolute, still, quiet attentiveness. You don't see it very often. And they're both good writers, aren't they? They're both good writers. And they're both very tall. I am five foot one. <laughs> and they're, they're very tall. So Jane Urquhart goes on to say that, that this book that we're talking about, Startle and Illuminate, captures the sound of Carol's voice it's very conversational. And I just wonder if that's something she always sought to achieve in her writing. I think she did. I mentioned this somewhere in the introduction, I think, that her advice to me when I was starting to do some writing was to write as though you were speaking into directly into the ear of an attentive listener, unmediated, without any artifice. She didn't much like artifice in storytelling, actually. Some, some writers frame their stories, um, and she didn't believe in that. She wanted that direct, um, unmediated narrative, uh, as if you were talking directly to the best kind of listener. And so I, I think that comes out in this book, and, and also because in the book Startle and Illuminate, Nicholas and I drew from sources that weren't always academic sources or speeches, but were in fact uh, letters and, and advice given in a more casual way. Yeah, so what is it about having a, what, a sympathetic reader or listener that you can benefit from as a writer? I think at least two things. One is that it's someone outside your own head. So you're not speaking to yourself, which I think is an echo chamber kind of writing. And the second is that if you pick the right perfect pearly ear, an intelligent, attentive, um, receptive, willing uh, audience, that is your best reader. (laughs) So in effect, you're writing to the person who you hope will read the book. Uh, And that's a a good shortcut, I think. Hmm. You quote her as saying there's no such thing as a boring life and surely there are people who live boring lives i think surely there are not it's actually a little parlor trick i play when i'm with someone at say a political dinner when when such things were possible and i would plumb them and plumb them and plumb them until i found the streak of interest in them that lay waiting to be struck uh, and it's always there. One, once it was a gentleman who just loved investing his own money. And once I hit on that topic, he was away to the races. And once it was a, a young, young man who had made his name by winning a, a belt buckle at the Calgary Stampede. So you just have to dig uh, and fossick until you come across that seam of gold and everyone has one. Even the people who sit around watching uh, Netflix uh, six hours a day. A hundred percent. Maybe, maybe especially them. They're open to narrative. True enough. Carol also recommends reading obituaries and paying attention, I guess, to other people and to the world around you. Again, this is advice to a potential writer. She also suggests that you should be on the lookout for good stories. So what's an example of just tripping across a good story? Not reading something in the paper, but how do you find a good story by being attentive? Well, my father tells a story about the two of them having dinner together out in New York one evening. And one of the wonderful, lovely things about New Yorkers is they speak loudly enough for you can listen to them. Uh, It's just delightful of them. Uh, and uh, she, dad was trying to talk to her over the table and she shushed him and said, I'm trying to listen to both people on both sides of the table. So I just can't decide which one to best listen to. So, so she was always open to it. Um, 
she said public writing, public transport was a good way to get stories. Um, she could get a story, as you might know if you've read her short stories, out of a sign posted in a shop window or out of um, an oblique reference in, a, in a, obituaries are fabulous for, for short stories, for stories and, and novels and more. Um, yeah, you just, it, it's that writerly eye, that openness to what is rich enough to give rise to a, a new kind of narrative. Yeah, it's being an inquirer, relentlessly curious, but also a bit of a voyeur. Oh, absolutely. But she was she was um, circumspect. She was quite she was quite concerned not to probe or embarrass the people closest to her. She didn't want to make people feel as though they were going to be used in any way. And so um, we, we include some advice in Startled and Eliminate about how to hide people or do them the service of, of hiding them, concealing them, dressing them up to be someone different so that they wouldn't observe that they had been incorporated into a story. And I think she was quite successful. And she said it wasn't really that hard that you could change the gender or the hair color or the uh, occupation and, and people didn't know that it was based on them. Yeah, I think she talks about getting to it do the writing, but then you can polish it up and revise and revise afterwards. Yes, and take away the identifiers. She she mentions, I think, yeah. in this book that she she once wrote about a woman who had said she was going to go and buy candles to match her house coat or a house coat to match her candles. I can't remember which. And she did use that. And she said the woman knew who she was. So that was the closest she flew to the flame, I think. And that doesn't sound too terrible, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound. I think Philip Roth used to get into a lot of trouble with his family. There are lots of writers that use their dear ones as material relentlessly. So yes, it's almost part of the profession, isn't it? Yes. So Carol asked you and your siblings to witness the creation of her work because she loved writing, and she thought you would too. I think that's lovely. Yeah, she truly felt that we could and should and might become part of a family enterprise. <laughs> she didn't think it was precious or beyond anybody, um, that it was something that someone could take, could take up. It's lucky that she had children like you who actually would uh, listen to her and actually, <laughs> and actually be interested in her. I have trouble getting my kids to be, pay any attention to what I'm doing at all. Oh, we largely ignored her. I, I, this is these are the the small amounts we can wring from our, our ordinary childhoods. Um, we ignored her as, as much as any kid did okay. or does. So it's true then. You do love writing. I do love writing, although I I mostly love having written. Yes, that's uh, that's. <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's quite stressful to get that blank page uh, over with. There's a wonderful artist in um, Nova Scotia, Tom Forrestal, who talks about how creating art is failing and failing and failing, and mm -hmm. how when he puts a paintbrush to a canvas, he has the, 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 the picture is perfect only before you touch the paintbrush to the canvas, and then you succeed and fail and succeed and fail. And, and um, I think writing is like that. Uh, well, most art making is like that. So again, it's that pushing through uh, and having confidence and continuing the narrative, despite that sense that every second sentence is in some way not quite what you wanted. So what you actually love about writing is showing it off once it's finished. <laughs> no, that's awkward, too, because you worry that everyone will see the, the mistakes. Uh, what do you love about writing? What does one love about writing? Well, I, I, I often liken it to dropping a bucket into a well and then seeing what comes up. And not that any of us, I mean, you or I or anyone, you know, I, where does that come from? We have it. How many times in our lifetimes have we dropped a bucket into a well? Probably never. But we know we had a sense what it is. There's this, there's plumbing of the subconscious and there's something that happens in that creative flow that is beyond ourselves. And why wouldn't we want to tap into that unless it's too frightening? Um, and I don't think it's too frightening. It's only the failure is frightening. And I, I think people can get at that creative flow in different ways. But if you're no good at anything else, then writing is, is the, the bucket you're going to be lowering down. Mm. So after you left home, you continued to read your mother's writing and you sent 
letters of validation. You say she needed validation as all writers do. She needed your validation. She needed validation. Did she need mine in particular? I don't know about that. But women in particular, I think, need validation because the world isn't really organized to validate our experiences. And women writers are a subset of women. So she found it uh, in uh, other writers, of course, uh, in, in her children when they paid attention. And of course, as she became better known in the letters she received from readers, from editors, from prize committees where, where she won awards, um, so she, she did get it. Was it enough? Uh, I don't know. Is it, do you ever get enough validation? <laughs> I, I think, yes, it was uh, for her. It became enough. I was a small part of that, not, not a large chunk of it. Hmm. This is more life advice, but she talks about taking up the things that are most important to us and bending time, the time that we have, to those important tasks. Yes. Yeah, that's probably the best legacy she's left for me. I have to say, is this idea of time as expansive and abundant rather than scant and hard to find. Um, I, 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 I didn't actually talk to her about this concept uh, while she was alive, although we obliquely talked about it in that it was innate in everything she did. But her idea was, you know, each of us every morning gets 24 hours given to us for free to do with as we will. And tomorrow when we wake up, we'll get another 24 hours and, tw and the next day. And it's actually a lot. It's abundant. It adds up into weeks and months and years. And so I have had little patience with people who talk about the days being too short or the weeks or their lifetime being too short because I think it depends on what you put your hours and days to and you should make time for those tasks that are important to you that feed you and now that's going to be harder when you have children under the age of whatever and a full-time job maybe a, a sick elderly parent or something like that there's going to be times in your life when time is genuinely hard to come by but over the course of a lifetime uh, there should be years in which you have time to dedicate to the making of things that are important to you. Yeah, I think there's probably a natural feedback loop too. Uh, if you do something that's important to you, if you spend time with it, you're going to feel good more of the time. Yes, that's true. Yes, yes. You're looking after yourself. You're looking after your creative self which can get pushed to the back of the to-do list uh, easily. There has to be a kind of rigor to getting to the work. My father tells a funny story about a, a, a period of time my parents spent in the French city of Tours. I think it was just a few months. And my, I think my mother was finishing a book and my father was working on his work. He, he's a civil engineer. And um, because uh, they were in a small rented apartment, uh, she made him go and sit in the car and read for two hours so that she could focus on her work. And he did it. <laughs> I think that was during the rainy or winter months when he couldn't just go on a stroll. So he'd go and sit in the car and read. <laughs> but it's more, I mean, there's discipline that's involved. That's part of it. But part of it is what? Just a different way of interacting with the world the time that you have and and not what not stressing about the fact that you don't have enough time to do anything what what is it is it, it yes it, it's reframing it's reframing so instead of looking at time as scarce and scant and fleeting and short look at it as abundant generously given uh, shapeable um, and and useful and available when you need it. Um, I think a lot of it is reframing. Uh, and then if you come from that framework, you will approach what you agree to do and how you do it differently. You might say yes to more things and get them done more quickly, or you might say no to more things and get what you want to get done. But I think it's a framework. And I, fi I find this is a helpful thing to tell young people starting out on work and raising families and all of that. Not because I think they shouldn't feel stressed from time to time, but because I think they shouldn't feel stressed from time to time. <laughs> I think they should not worry about it as much as they might. Yeah. The constant narrative is I never have a minute to myself. I th well, you, you can. 
you can have a minute to yourself. So what made uh, Carol Shields such a great writer? I think she says it in this book, questioning yourself always, is that what I mean to say? And often it isn't because you're caught up on some external narrative that you have to separate yourself from. And her idea also that you write the book that you want to read but can't find, I think is a helpful one as well. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, you're writing to fill a need. And of course, it's your own personal need. But I think we know enough about ourselves to know that if you personally have a strongly felt need, others are likely to have it too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She wrote a story behind a story in the sense that there was always a larger issue uh, behind what she wrote, a larger question, um, you know, whether it be the nature of love or the nature of loss or the erasure of a woman's life. She had a bigger question that she tackled through the vehicle of a novel or a short story or a play. And so that gave her writing a universal and probably uh, a kind of importance that, well, one would hope would transcend place and time. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. She uses uh, in brackets uh, throughout a part of the book, the word snip. Snip, snip, snip. It's uh, things that take away the voices and the experiences of various groups in society, women or people of color or whatever it might happen to be. So it seems to me that that was an, an important part of what she wanted to do was to stop snipping. Yes, yes. Uh, and and I, that wasn't just a question of being able to write stories that were otherwise on the cutting room floor, but also of allowing people who were on the cutting room floor to see that their stories were as worthy of narrative as anyone else's. Yeah, yeah. That gets to a, a point about the prize itself. The fact that it's just open for women in North America, it's an incentive for women to strive to be better than good? <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's a way to shine focus on stories that might otherwise not have that focus given to them. And the uh, prize shouldn't be necessary. And certainly different countries have wrestled with this question. There will certainly come a time when it's not necessary, probably not within my lifetime, so I will never be able to witness it. Right. But the old neurons that still fire at the notion of a great male writer don't quite fire in the same way at the notion of a great woman writer yet. And so there's still some work to be done. And certainly we are doing better now than we did, at least in North America, say 40 years ago, uh, but there's still work to be done. And the prize is going to tackle some of that necessary work. It's not that uh, George Eliot or Jane Austen haven't been lauded as just as great as any male writer. Yes, there are some great white canonical writers who would disagree with you and have done so. And uh, people who have uh, I said, for example, of my mother, that she wrote uh, picket fence stories. So there's this kind of diminishment yeah. of the narrative that is subconscious and, and maybe or maybe conscious and very, very damaging. As if any art, uh, woman that wrote about private lives somehow is diminishing the art form. And as my mother often said, don't men have private lives? <laughs> they have them too. Yeah. Yeah, she's been criticized for writing about, quote, ordinary people, right? Yes. As if there's anyone that isn't ordinary. Yeah, that's what we, we talked about a bit earlier, didn't we? Yes. Netflix. <laughs> yes. We're all ordinary. We're all ordinary. Well, we all experience things like jealousy and if we're lucky, uh, love of different types, regardless on what stage or scale. Regardless. Yes. And we have old friends we made and we've kept all on the way and 
we've we have very similar arc our the arcs of our lives are, are similar famous or not yeah you talk about uh, learning to rely or she does on your own voice and having faith in your own experience yes so those diminishing words then are maybe a little less damaging yeah and then she says it's important to discover what you should write about and who your audience should be. Yes. Now that's a hard one. When you're starting out, how do you know? And of course, there's writers who have different audiences and write, for example, under different names for different audiences. So I don't think it's a one for all decision. And you write a different book in your 20s than you do in your 60s. So you're not being shoehorned into a mold. And I think it's a constant inquiry of yourself. Who, who are you writing for? What do you want to say? Then Carol quotes Alice Munro talking about uh, real experience being a lump of starter dough. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? That's really good, yeah. Yes, and then you, you take off from it. You don't feel constrained by it. You don't have to stick to the facts. The wonderful thing about fiction, you can start with that starter dough and then leave it, in fact, leave it behind. My mother talked a lot about structure, in particular in writing novels, and how you start with a structure and you that helps you get started, but you don't have to adhere to it religiously through the whole novel. You're, you're, there's a time when maybe that structure is pushed aside or falls aside, that it's gotten you up uh, and writing. She sometimes compared writing a novel to getting an elephant, a recalcitrant elephant up onto all four legs. Uh, you might get two or three legs under it and then the other two might go down again. Uh, writing a novel is a bit like that. I sometimes think of it as getting tent, all the tent poles up in one of those complicated tents. Hmm. Yes, the alchemy of, of reimagined reality. The alchemy of reimagined reality. And there are universes there. Yeah. Now she taught creative writing classes and uh, recommended avoiding cliches and sentimentality to understand point of view, to learn to notice things and then to recognize a story. You know, we've already touched on that. How would you recognize a story? Yes. Or have, or have we? Well, I think part of the recognition of story is recognizing that a story can take so many forms. And you may be constrained by either not having read, which she was very much against, or by having read only a certain kind of book before. So you only imagine a certain kind of story to be a story. And I think what she tried to do was break down in her students' minds the idea that there was only one kind of story and the idea that a story had to have a certain kind of arc. And she compared the classic narrative arc that had been taught to her and which she herself taught for several years until she learned better as the kind of spatula rising up to a denouement and then falling off, which I think is a wonderful image. And uh, that story uh, can take many, many forms. Uh, we're familiar with postcard stories, you know, uh, and, and she wrote uh, little short stories as well, and, and the stories that she called her little weirdies. And um, she became braver, I think, as she, she said as she came, became older, but I think it's also as she became more experienced in learning that a story can uh, take all kinds of forms. Um, and in her novel, she used different narrative structures uh, and came to delight in trying different structures to tell what might be an, an, an older story, but in a completely new way. Well, really, when you think of it, a story is just something that keeps people reading. I think that's right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That lovely uh, page turner thing. Yeah. And, I, you know, I often look at page turners per se, you know, that the ones that are just known, books that are known for being page turners, because I want to know what yes. it is that does it. And I remember picking up a Dan Brown book, which is not sort of the genre I read. And I was very interested to see on the first page that he just grabbed you by the throat and pulled you in. He was a consummate storyteller. But well, I know just speaking from my own experience, if, if I'm really interested in something, and they're they're telling me about it. It's it's an interest level. It's like okay, maybe I'm yes. interested in that period. I'm interested in the things that are being described. 
But even, you know, a really good storyteller, I'm thinking of John McPhee, the writer, uh, the US writer of nonfiction. Uh, he can write about geology, which is not an area I'm particularly interested in, in a way that makes the book, you just can't put it down. You cannot yeah. put it down. And I think, so it's, you're halfway there if you're already interested in the subject matter. But if you're not interested in the subject matter and they still pull you in, that's a storyteller. Yes. So what was Carol's strength as a, as a teacher and a writer and a mom? Oh, goodness gracious. As a teacher, she loved her students. She encouraged them. She believed in them. She felt that they each had a story to tell. Um, and she helped them, you know, get past themselves, the barriers that stopped them from writing and writing well. Uh, let's see. As a writer, what was her secret? I, I, she had this saying that she said to her kids, um, and I, no doubt to others, which was to always be as intelligent as you are. And I, I think that was important to know that when you write too, I think you have to be as intelligent as you are. You have to give your reader the respect of believing that they are intelligent too. And I think a reader knows when they're being respected by the writer. Yeah. Uh, as a mother, as a mother, what was her great gift? That wonderful attentiveness. And I have to say, you know, I talk about attentiveness, but she was also a good mother at ignoring you when you needed to be ignored. She wasn't a ho she wasn't a hovering mother or a helicopter mother, whatever they call them now. She gave us ample space to have our own lives, uh, imaginative and otherwise. Um, and she did not look upon our doings as either thanks to her or in spite of her. Uh, she looked at us as independent creatures with lives and desires of our own, and she was grateful. She was. She was. She, we were grateful for that. Yeah, respect really does uh, come through in all of those. Yeah. Respect. So important. The frightening thing about writing fiction is the extent to which you expose yourself. You scatter clues about who you are and what obsesses you, which speaks to an element of egotism and... Self-obsession. I put those last two in there. <laughs> what do you think? Well, ultimately, it's just one person writing, unless you're writing in a partnership. So it has to be all of you, including the ego and the id and all those other bits of you that you may not be as familiar with. Um, you put part of yourself in everything you write, although, of course, not nearly as much as people often imagine, because part of the distancing that I think happens when you write well is to be able to look at your characters from some distance and if they're you in all their guises they're all going to walk and talk and do an act just like you they have to be wholly individualized separate creatures and so um, there's that stepping aside from yourself that is delicious to achieve and hard to achieve but also leads to the best writing. Yeah, it's interesting that she is described as being humble. Uh, humility comes into people's uh, descriptions of her. It was humble is a kind of a terrible word, word isn't it, in some ways? Um, there is a self-effacing aspect to it, which I think is not appealing. I, I think I would call it a sense of equality. She believed that everyone had natures both noble and otherwise and stories to tell and so I don't I don't see her as hierarchical but it wasn't a matter of putting herself below or above people it was putting herself among people um, in a way that made them feel comfortable it, um, so what is that humility I suppose you could call it that it's kind of a, a mumbly yes. smarmy word isn't it um, it is but I'm just trying to get at this fact that I think quite a bit of novel writing can be egotistical. It is all about the writer. It has to be. It Yes. So but then I part of the job of the writer is to take themselves out of the equation if they yeah. do it well. We all know writers, well, I mean, I don't know if that's true if they even do it well, but I know writers like Jamaica Kincaid, who it's always about herself and her mother, and she does it brilliantly. And I wouldn't want it to be different. It's just genius. It's genius. And that's her material. So maybe yeah. that, maybe that yourself and, and your life and your mother or whatever is your material. And for, but for others, uh, no. Uh, so I, I can't. You can't really compare them. Some for some writers, the job of getting out of ego is important, and for others, it isn't. 
so um yeah you know there's a sense of ego in in Alice Munro's writing, her sense of fierce intelligence and independence comes through in everything she wrote. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be her writing without that. So Carol talks about the importance of putting the right detail in the right place, but that overindulgence slows the story down so that cutting is important because it increases pace. But then she says that fiction is made up of scenes that are invariably rushed and that they must be introduced, allowed to develop and concluded in a way that prepares for the next scene. So which is it? Speeding up or slowing down? <laughs> what, you want consistency? <laughs> <laughs> I think she was a bit impatient with elliptical writers who sketched in scenes. Yeah. She wanted to be more rooted than that. She wanted a sense that the writer knew him or herself, whether the settee was brown or whether the car was a Ford, um, without having to say so. So there's that sense of being rooted in a real scene, in a real world that she liked. And that requires some scene setting and some gesturing toward a full world. So, uh, you know, once again, though, there are elliptical writers who do just fine. Um, but it has, they have to, I think, focus on making that a strength and not a crutch, and not a way out of dealing with the messier parts of, of fiction writing. Yeah. So scene making is important. And part of scene making comes from <clears throat> the details of place. And Jane Austen, she says, was superb at this. She wrote a book on Jane Austen. She did. A wonderful book. A wonderful book. Yes. Yeah. And so what's she like about Jane so much? Well, who doesn't like Jane? <laughs> uh, she did like Jane. Her intelligence, her wit, her crispness, her um, ability to set that scene, uh, her character development, her confidence um, in, in her material. And what's not to like? Um, I mean, all... Yeah. I, all of us owe a debt to Jane that will never die. Scene setting. She, I remember her telling me she thought we had to know how old the the writer, the the, the main characters were, and uh, what they did and what their lives were like. We couldn't fudge it and think they're somewhere between twenty and sixty. I'm mean, obviously there has to be a, a sense of concrete rootedness to them to, for them to be believable. Yeah. Yeah, she talks about the importance of sense of place, place in time, and the fact that scenes can, and this is one of her favorite words, thickened. Yes, yes, yes. And thickened by dialogue that reveals character and moves the story forward. So I guess, the, how long should scenes be? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, there can be no rule. <laughs> but... There was a book by Mark Twain where he got sick of everyone. And uh, so he had them all go out and fall down a well one day. So surely that's not quite long enough. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat longer than everyone falling down a well one day. I don't know why I keep coming back to wells, but somehow I do. Yeah, there's the, the, some deep, deep uh, <laughs> psychology there. Yes, okay. So you, uh, she says, as long as it's inventive, beguiling and yielding answers to the question, what is this story about? Yes. And in fact, before I finished my first novel, my mother had died and I wasn't able to ask her the question, which I most wanted to ask her, well, among many, which was, how do I know when a book is finished? Yeah. And that quote helped me because could beyond page 364, was the story still developing and beguiling and reaping new insights? And if the answer is no, then you have to put a bow on it and send it off to the publisher. So uh, that is a good test, actually. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, she talks about trusting your reader to know what you mean, but you have to give them something to work with. And uh, the indicators of who your main characters are are important for them. They will ultimately furnish that piece differently than you will but um, they'll be along with you so long as you've given enough information for them to follow you so what's wrong with just uh, beautiful writing on its own no, 
nothing's wrong with beautiful writing on itself. Why does it have to have all of this stuff, this uh, inventive, beguiling, yielding answers? Why can't we just have beautiful writing? Wouldn't you? What would you rather have? Beautiful writing or inventive, beguiling, and, uh, and uh, with something with a sense of urgency to it? I'd like both. Thank you. <laughs> and that would be the best, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes beautiful writing can get in the way of things, too. True, true. Um, and, you know, we're lucky in those of us who write in English because we have kind of at least a dual vocabulary, the, the Latinate fancy stuff and the, uh, the uh, Germanic uh, less fancy stuff to work with, which gives us a fabulous palette to choose from in terms, uh, of, in terms of beautiful writing. It does, doesn't it? We're very fortunate. We've got a mongrel language. We do. And that is, what, what better to write in? Yeah, yeah. Maybe Yiddish, but I can't write in Yiddish or, Yiddish or read it, so. No. So expressive, though, Yiddish. So expressive, yes. A, a little bit jealous, yes. Yeah. She talks about the importance of pacing and breaks, chapters and paragraphs. Style and quirky syntax help set speed, the speed at which we read. Ultimately, it's the writer's ability to communicate with passion that keeps eyes moving along lines of print. Yes, passion. Yeah. Passion. Investment. I call it investment, maybe a shortcut where you feel somewhat invested. Uh, I was reading, oh, this book, Margaret Visser's book, The Geometry of Love, uh, over the weekend. Oh, yes. Uh, and she won the Charles yeah. Taylor Prize for it. It's nonfiction, but it has that uh, headlong impetus to it. I just couldn't put it down. It was working toward a fundamental mystery. And uh, I love that. We never get over you know, uh, buried treasure, uh, things in the attic, a uh, 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 found diary, uh, uh, hidden secrets that become learned. We are, we're all delving, I think, toward an, a quest of some new knowledge. And the best books yeah. take us with them on that quest. They feed us, don't they? That we're oh. hungry, they feed Yes, yes. And, and we all have had it, that, that wonderful sense of it being midnight and you have, you look at the rest of the book and there's another third left and you think it's worth it. Even though there's 120 pages left, I am just going to make another cup of tea and I'm going to continue to turn the pages. What's more delicious than that? Yeah. But there's also this dissatisfaction, right? That our lives aren't quite enough. Maybe that would be the answer to your earlier question. Are there boring people? Yes. Are there people for whom their own life is enough? Yeah. I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Do you? Well, I would say, uh, you know, that's what religion is there for, to answer all their questions. And if, they're, if they've got all their answers or questions answered, then they're not curious to, to go out and read and learn. I remember listening to um, a cross-country checkup years and years ago on CBC, and uh, it was about illiteracy and, the, and how terrible it was. And a caller called him. It's always remained with me. And he said, there's one thing worse than being illiterate. And the host said, what could that be? And he said, it's knowing only one book. Yes, and I but... thought how insightful that was. Yeah. The danger of knowing only one book. And I think you can extrapolate that to the danger of knowing only oneself. Um, that would be not the best way, I would think, to live life and might lead to someone who was a dinner companion, you might not be able to dig down to a, a band of gold. Yeah, so we, we found that person. Do they exist though? Do they exist? Uh, okay, I'm gonna just in, in winding down here, I'm going to quote from page 106 in Startle and Illuminate. And this is uh, in reference to the prize again. The Carol Shields Prize. This made me think of the prize. The quote is, I am interested in, in writing away the invisibility of women's lives, looking at writing as an act of redemption. In order to do this, I need the companionship, the example of other women who are writing. This makes us in some ways braver. Yes. I think that's true. Bravery does come into it. Yeah. So that's another reason why you've got the prize. That's, you know, you've told me another reason because I'd forgotten that. 
Um, but yes, bravery does come courage, uh, the, the strength of numbers. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I had forgotten that, yeah. uh, Nigel. So I think you're quite right. Group courage. It would make you braver as a writer. Yeah. 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 And one other quote, uh, this is on page 117. The manufacturers of Dewar's Scotch whiskey know how much we need the seeds of stories and how we need to, to place our own stories beside those of others, to compare, weigh, judge, and forgive, and to find an angle of vision that renews our image of where we are in the world. And so my question is, why do we need to know where we are in the world? <laughs> well, maybe it's an Archimedes story, you know, give me a, a place to put it and uh, with my lever, I can move the world. Um, if you don't set it down somewhere squarely, uh, it won't work. Yeah. And so I think there's a question of being able to push against. So when you're rooted in one place or you have a sense of place, that gives you the freedom to push from it, um, which you can't do if the ground is soft under your feet or unknown or, or if you're frightened of it. Um, so there's a kind of security, a rootedness. Um, I've always thought of rootedness of being one of those wonderful two-faced topics where you are both grounded and you push can push against it. It's, it's a bit like a, the Janus, the old Janus god. Mm -hmm looking in two directions. Um, and I think, um, I've often said this to the students at, at Simon Fraser, that one of the benefits of an education is being able to think to totally, two totally incompatible ideas at the same time. Yes. Uh, and I think what we're hearing in some of what my mother said and wrote is that um, there are different ways to see the same sets of facts and that doesn't make one of them wrong. It makes each of them stronger to have that that opposing twin. So uh, a sense of place gives you the ability to, to leave it. And a sense of place gives you the ability to, to write about it and to stay there and to understand it. You know, it's funny, we were talking about The Great Gatsby and that book is full of all sorts of contradictions. Yes, it is, it is. And the best books are, yes. the best books are. Yeah. Anything else on why this prize? Well, I think uh, partly because it's cross-border. Uh, I think that a part of the impetus was the border is only important if we allow it to be important. And there are, we read each other's books. We buy each other's books. Yeah. We write for each other's audiences. We seek to understand each other, notwithstanding what we may think, the differences between lives lived in the States and Canada are, 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 are small. And um, uh, we can tell each other narratives that will make each of us better. Uh, and we should be telling each other narratives. And why should that uh, imaginary line divide us in a way that it doesn't have to? So that was part of it was there really isn't something like it existing. Uh, and the other sense was this need for women to have uh, something of their own, something to grow towards, something to, to aspire to. And also there will be other parts of the prize. It won't just be one winner. There will be uh, a coaching program. There will be uh, retreats. There'll be advice given. Uh, there's lots of other integrated parts. Uh, there'll be ways for prize winners to share what they have done with others and bring along other great writers. And nobody can be against a uh, growth in good writers to read. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a whole new area of uh, nationalism and is it a good thing or a bad thing? But, <laughs> but uh, of course she was born, Carol was born in the States, right? Yes, in Oak Park, Illinois, yes. Yeah. Yes, Hemingway country. Hemingway country, yes. She kept her American citizenship and her Canadian citizenship, which is why she was able to win the Pulitzer because only Americans can win the Pulitzer. I don't yes. think there's anyone else that's won both a Governor General Award for for Literature and the Pulitzer Prize for for Fiction. I think I think she might be the one the one. But maybe in the future, 
there'll be another because of the prize. Wouldn't that be lovely? Finally, just uh, any other thoughts about uh, Carol that we've left unsaid? Oh, we don't want there's so much unsaid. unsaid. <laughs> How much we all miss her. Oh, we miss her terribly. She was quite young when she died. She died 17 years ago. Uh, she had just turned 68. Uh, so it was a bit of a cheat. Uh, my father yep. is still alive. Uh, he's 86, so she would have been 86 or so had she lived. And uh, I just think of all those books we would have had out of those 17 years, it, it breaks my heart. Um, but there are wonderful writers, male and female writing books that we will have to make do with <laughs> failing those missing Carol Shields books. Uh, and she would be delighted to see the rise, I think, for example, most recently of writers of color being recognized and given uh, larger platforms. and. Uh, you know, when she was first writing, and for much of my career in business, uh, women have been considered to be the other, the, the diversity. And, uh, and lo and behold, we were just the first shoe in the door. And uh, I think our job as women is to hold that door open and make sure that uh, all the voices that have stories um, have a possibility of finding uh, receptive audiences. Um, so it was just a, a little bit toward that, I think, that women started to be the other. And I was going to say also, I, th I think the, the prize has had some criticism for being women only and not available to men. And um, there are lots of prizes that men can and do win. And as I say, ultimately, I don't think the prize will be around forever because it won't need to be. Yeah. How many books did she write all together? Oh, goodness. I, don't, I haven't counted 17, 20, that range. Uh, between novels, um, poetry. There's lots for us to go back to. Yes, there is. There is lots to go back to. But I still begrudge the missing books that we don't have. Yeah. Well, those are in our imagination. Yes, they're in our imagination. Yeah. And so if we go back to our Thomas Forrestal image, they're still perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, it was uh, perfectly wonderful to talk to you. Well, Nigel, thank you for doing this. You're doing interesting things. You're talking to interesting people. I am going to pay attention. Thank you. Well, you're an interesting person. So uh, best of luck with the prize. Best of luck with the, the, the novels coming up. Are you working on anything in particular? I, I am. In fact, I'm just working up my nerve to send it off to my publisher. But you know that sort of tidying and fussing and so uh, I, but I, I have to, I keep delaying it just so I can make it perfect, but it's not going to be perfect. So maybe this will be the impetus for mid press send. Very good. Take care. You too. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye bye.